say, but. Uh, but yeah, I'm last that... last week they start sending you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> those setting messages <laughs> that yeah. you are being downgraded, <laughs> so you have to put in some extra money. Extra money, exactly. I mean, I everybody says why are you sticking to MTNL, but uh, I still feel that uh, one should do one's bit for the country, no? <laughs> so. Uh, ma'am, we have about a minute left. So I've started the recording and we can, I'll start the YouTube stream in about a minute. So you can start them. Uh, yeah, ma'am, you can go ahead. Should I start then? Okay, it's dot on six. So um, a very, very good time of the day, morning or evening, uh, as the case may be, uh, to all of you. Um, it's extremely um, invigorating um, and heartening to see Oh, yes, we've completed a century now. <laughs> there are 100 uh, participants who are attending this. Um, and at a time when we are we really inundated, uh, nay, um, saturated is the word, with a discourse on India-China relations that is marked by extreme belligerence and provocation um, with all possible variants of strategic and tactical confrontation, denunciation stemming from emotive nationalism, um, and... Uh, diatribes uh, drenched in distrust. It's a nice alliteration, right? So this book is uh, more than a breath of fresh air. And uh, pardon my use of this analogy in these COVID days, uh, it is vitally needed oxygen for our scholarly lungs. Uh, and and I, I, I would even go uh, uh, to, uh, further to say that uh, it's a critical therapeutic intervention uh, in this time of crisis. Uh, I must begin um, with a confession. Having received the book uh, uh, only a couple of days back, I have only read the crisp but comprehensive introduction, um, the crisper but highly thought-provoking epilogue, uh, and the chapter by Madhavi. Um, to whom, in fact, I owe my initiation into the significance of this fascinating historical period. Uh, and, I, and I must here recall uh, her efforts in starting the archival project uh, at the ICS and helping the Institute to uh, conduct a series of workshops in this regard during my directorship. Uh, in fact, the catalog of materials related to modern China in the National Archives of India, that was the title, yes. It was published as an occasional paper by the ICS in 2013. Uh, and I can, I can say for a fact that it has contributed to triggering an interest in the history of India-China relations uh, among young researchers. Now, uh, according to the program, I have 10 minutes. I assure you I will not go beyond five more minutes. So just let me <laughs> uh, say a few things. Uh, see, many of the themes that are woven in this volume uh, have in fact been the subject of considerable discussion and research uh, by the faculty of the ICS. Um, the civilizational dimension, for instance, or the Himalaya sphere uh, fathered <clears throat> by uh, Professor Than Chung, which is um, viewed as quote unquote, uh, idealistic and controversial, uh, the use of critical theories in comparative analysis, um, the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist underpinnings um, of scholarship in India, China interactions, uh, alternative modernities, and so on. Uh, so this, this has been part of a very important part of the uh, intellectual focus of the Institute of Chinese Studies. And therefore it is truly wonderful that we see this quote unquote, zone of convergence uh, to borrow Prasenjit's marvelous coinage, um, which I believe perfectly describes this assembly uh, of China centers from the School of International Studies and the School of Language, Literature, Culture Studies in the JNU, 
the Indian Council of World Affairs uh, and the publishers of this uh, notable volume on the ICS platform. Now, as I said, I do not intend to stand between you and the feast that has been laid out. Uh, I will just take a couple of minutes to air some thoughts uh, that I have been tossing about in my head for some time now, discussed occasionally with colleagues, but which are still in need of greater refinement and elucidation. And I'm hopeful that after this discussion is over, uh, I will have uh, gathered enough pointers to take me further ahead in my own uh, illuminations and reflections. Now, the first is this business of Asia. We are taking up for study a, a landmass described as a continent and named Asia. What is this Asia? What, uh, what trusses us? What connects us as Asians? Uh, it was my guru, uh, Professor Deshpande, uh, GPD as I used to call him, who first instructed me about the fact that most of the Indian languages, the classical tongues, Sanskrit and Pali, for instance, or even the more modern ones uh, dating back to about a thousand years or so, do not have a name for Asia. There is at best a transliteration. In fact, he said that there was no awareness of Asia in the pre-colonial times. Neither does there seem to be an, a Chinese word. Yacho is a transliteration. Uh, the dictionary tells us that Yacho is a word for Asia. So as GPD used to say that even classical Chinese tradition has no awareness of Asia. It was Europe which created this awareness. And it was that the colonial encounter uh, that brings Asia into our framework. The second aspect is uh, with respect to the understanding of Asia. You know, idealist or realist perceptions of Asian-ness or Asian unity would stem from how we understand Asia. In that context, uh, Takeuchi Yoshimi's Asia as method or Okakura Tenshin's pan-Asianism are indeed, as has been said in the introduction, replete with ambiguity. But this does trigger further thinking on uh, on, on, on what, on, on this construction of Asia. And it actually resonates also with what the editors refer to as the arbitrariness of categories uh, in the introduction. Because much of what we understand as Asia is an invention of colonial scholarship, what, what Said said uh, explained as Orientalism. Because not all Asian entities and civilizations were treated equally in colonial scholarship. Um, uh, Pan-Asianism, as Prasenjit has pointed out in the epilogue, was a hijacking uh, by Japanese militarists to serve an ideology of imperialist domination, a kind of uh, imperialism of anti-imperialism, uh, another <laughs> delightful uh, phrase. So that's probably one of the factors, one of the many factors, which could explain why no Pan-Asian movement ever succeeded. Now, President Chief has also pointed out that there has been little analysis of, quote unquote, on the ground relations between India, modern India and China. So the question that flows out of the two points that I have just mentioned is that, is it because this landmass we call Asia and the billions of Asians who inhabit this landmass uh, do not really have a common or shared view of Asia, which could be a critical binder in their relationship? To the extent that we saw this surge in Asian consciousness during the anti-colonial times has been completely dissipated with the emergence of the developmental nation state and the globalized economy. So the, the thing that keeps on, uh, uh, that, that I keep on grappling with is that Europe defined Asia for the Asians. Maybe this volume will help us embark on a process of reverse engineering, as it were. Maybe it's time to settle scores with Hegel, in a manner of speaking. I'm happy now to introduce uh, Ambassador TCA Raghavan. Um, actually, that's an oxymoron. Since no introduction is really required, it would be more apt to say that I now call upon Ambassador Raghavan, uh, a former Indian diplomat whose understanding and knowledge on Pakistan has probably no parallel in the foreign service today. 
After a vast and varied career in many parts of the world, Mr. Raghavan's last stint was High Commissioner of India to Pakistan. Uh, however, it is after retirement that things got more interesting. Uh, his background in the discipline of history came to the fore. Uh, and he authored two books, the first uh, biography of two Mughal nobles and um, the other a study of India-Pakistan relations. Um, since uh, July 2018, uh, he has been the Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs and has uh, organized an extremely interesting range of events, bringing together noted and notable scholars, practitioners, diplomats and state leaders uh, to interact on issues of contemporary significance. Uh, we are extremely happy that he has accepted our invitation to don his historian's hat this evening and deliver the keynote address. Ambassador Raghavan, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Acharya, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ashok Kant, and thank you, Tansen Sen, for inviting me and inviting the ICWA uh, to join in the launch of this wonderful volume. Uh, on behalf of the ICW, I can say that I'm delighted that we can do this uh, together with the in Institute of Chinese uh, uh, Studies. Some months earlier, uh, before the pandemic, uh, we had a commemorative event at Sapru House uh, on the 50 years of the Institute of Chinese Studies. And it was appropriate because the Institute of Chinese Studies uh, really was born on the lawns of Sapru House as Professor Mohanty had then uh, reminded us. So I'm very happy that we can do this event uh, together. And I'm sure there'll be many other opportunities for the ICS uh, and the ICWA uh, to do things uh, together. May I congratulate you, uh, Professor Tansen Sen, and also your uh, co-editor, Professor Brian Su, and also all the contributors to this uh, wonderful volume uh, which uh, juxtaposes a number of uh, themes, India and China, of course, but also uh, on, in the wider canvas of uh, Asia or Pan-Asianism. The title, of course, suggests that uh, uh, you want to look at India-China relations in their own right uh, and st step back from uh, Pan-Asianism because that has been the traditional context uh, in which uh, Many uh, uh, ideas of India-China relations have been uh, constructed, but the book itself throws up uh, uh, really many uh, different points of view and also opens up various lines of inquiry. So I do wish to congratulate you on this very seminal work because uh, uh, the, the present context was uh, pointed to by Professor Alka Acharya, but both India and China uh, are going to have uh, relations which are of great importance, not just for themselves, but also for uh, the whole region and indeed for the world. So a deep history of that relationship from different points of uh, view, and especially looking at the 19th and early 20th centuries uh, in greater detail is something to be greatly welcomed. And I congratulate you again uh, on the set of ideas which uh, would have led to this uh, volume and the different contributions uh, to it. Now, I'm not an expert on the uh, subject, so I don't wish to comment on any of the uh, papers or the introduction or the very fine epilogue by Professor, uh, Professor Prasenjit Dwara, but some stray thoughts uh, uh, did come to me, uh, and I thought of uh, sharing them uh, with, of course, uh, the initial disclaimer that I'm by no means uh, a scholar uh, of the subject and my own uh, understanding of it is really derived from the writing of scholars such as uh, those present uh, here. Uh, the first point which came to me was uh, about the complexities of Asianism, some of which were pointed to by Professor Alka Acharya, but really the, the idea of Asia in Asia received a very great fill up uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, following the Japanese victory uh, over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, I think uh, in India, certainly, uh, because that moment coincided with a nationalist upsurge following the partition of Bengal uh, and the rise of the Swadeshi movement, 
but it certainly made many public figures in India start looking at the map of the world and trying to identify the Asian continent within it with much greater interest than they had done uh, in, the, uh, in the past. Uh, but as one of the chapters in this, books, uh, book, in this book brings out, uh, even at that time, there was a great deal of ambiguity uh, surrounding this uh, view of Asia. Because in India, certainly, uh, the Japanese victory was uh, seen as a great uh, triumph uh, for the whole uh, concept of a non-European power uh, establishing uh, a powerful hegemonic position on the world stage. Uh, in China, the view was, of course, much more nuanced and perhaps much more cynical because of their own experience of uh, the interface with Japan uh, in the late uh, 19th uh, century. But nevertheless, uh, the, the principal takeaway which remained was uh, the emergence of a kind of triangle between uh, Japan, India, and China. And in many ways that has remained uh, with us uh, uh, certainly through the first half of the 20th uh, century and perhaps in many ways uh, up to uh, our own uh, times. Uh, it is also uh, true that while uh, the, the ideas of Asia emerged uh, very strongly uh, in India only from the first decade of the 20th century, but there were intellectuals who were thinking about uh, the rest of Asia uh, as they sought to understand European domination uh, of the world uh, even earlier. One example which comes to mind is of Keshav Chandra Sen, a leading intellectual of the Brahmo Samaj uh, in Calcutta. And he in the 1880s spoke a great deal about the idea of Asia uh, in opposition and in juxtaposition to the idea uh, of Europe. And that, that stream of thinking, in fact, has a long continuity uh, through Tagore, through Chitranjan Das, uh, to Jawaharlal Nehru uh, and really ends in some ways with the holding of the Asian Relations Conference, which the ICWA hosted uh, in uh, New Delhi in 1947, a few months uh, before uh, our independence. And again, it is interesting to find uh, at the Asian Relations Conference, this Japan, India, China triangle, uh, again, assumed some uh, importance because we are working on an internal history of the ICWA. And in many of the documents which we have encountered, we find this question uh, very, very important at that time of who to invite from Japan. Because Jap Japan was then under uh, American uh, occupation. And the question of who finally would attend from Japan remained unanswered till the inaugural of the uh, conference. So this is one thought which uh, which uh, came to me. Uh, the other point which uh, emerged, and I read Professor Dwara's epilogue about uh, nationalism and Asianism uh, uh, when he, he has some uh, ideas about that. Uh, and really, it, I recalled something which my former teacher, Professor Sabisachi Bhattacharya, uh, had said to me. And I thought it is relevant uh, because so much of uh, in the India-China uh, interface, both in a purely bilateral context, but also in a wider, against the wider canvas of Asia, uh, is informed by uh, nationalism. And uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya had uh, pointed to what he called a historical paradox um, uh, between uh, nationalism and the ideas of uh, Asianism. And I uh, cannot but resist reading out a small quote from one of his uh, writings, and I quote, I would like to point to a historical uh, paradox. To my mind, it is a historical paradox that the transnational idea of Asianism arises from the discourse of nationalism in modern times. Uh, it was the nationalist ideologues who posited in the late 19th century and in the 20th centuries, the transnational notion of Asia as a larger civilizational category distinct from the political entity, the nation state, which nationalists made it their business to create or shape. The paradox lies in the apparent contradiction between the intellectual stances in respect of the inclusive discourse 
uh, on civilization on the one hand, and on the other, the exclusionary principle inherent in the discourse of nationality and citizenship. So uh, really taking up what Prasenji Dwara says in his epilogue, and I'm sure you'll talk about it uh, also, uh, this, uh, this idea of nationalism as a principal factor in whichever way we look at in the India-China uh, interface, whether in the 19th century or post-1947, uh, uh, post, uh, remains as a very, very predominant idea. And we cannot really erase it, even when we try to uh, locate it within the larger canvas of uh, uh, pan-Asianism uh, and uh, uh, Asian, uh, Asianism. Uh, the third point which came to my mind was about uh, the discourses on uh, uh, India and China uh, from intellectuals in both these countries, respectively. And uh, in the chapters, there were many such uh, illustrations about uh, historians, uh, writers, uh, and many others uh, uh, who, who, who dwelt a great deal uh, on this uh, subject, uh, led, of course, by Rabindranath Tagore, but also Jawaharlal Nehru, and many, many uh, others. Uh, uh, this, this tradition was, of course, till 1962, uh, very strong uh, in India. And came Panika, someone else who was associated with the ICWA in the 1950s, uh, had written, again, I quote, undoubtedly what gave a spiritual and central unity to, na to non-Islamic Asia was the prolonged contact between India uh, and China. Now, what interested me was that while we know about uh, the, political, the political opposition to this idea uh, and a counter view, uh, which was articulated in many ways by Sadar Patel's very famous letter uh, to Jawaharlal Nehru uh, in uh, the late 1950s and early 1950s about uh, chi India's China uh, policy. But I wonder about other critiques. And certainly, uh, there were a number of uh, historical and intellectual critiques uh, of this particular view of uh, uh, India-China relations and two people who come to mind, and I would very much like to know more about them. Were, one of them is uh, Dr. Raghubira, who founded the, uh, founded the Institute of Asian Culture, made many visits to China, and in many ways was a scholar of uh, uh, Chinese and Indian uh, civilizational contacts. But he was a very strong critic of this view uh, from the early 1950s. And the second person who comes to mind uh, is the great Indian Tibetologist uh, Nirmal Chandra Sinha. Uh, and recently I encountered a lecture which he gave in the University of Bhagalpur uh, about how uh, this idea of uh, India-China interface that is smooth is fundamentally flawed. So I do think given the context of our own times and in the interests of a fair and objective deep history of India-China intellectual contacts, these counter critiques uh, also require to be reflected on uh, and uh, used in our construction of uh, architecture of India-China relations. My final point is uh, not directly related, but it's something which has interested me for uh, many years. Uh, and it is about a tangential view of China, which a number of historians who were otherwise not great, uh, very close scholars of Chinese history, but this this tangential view of China, which they developed uh, from the 1920s and 1930s uh, because of their interest in Southeast Asia. Uh, now, this, this group of historians had uh, grouped themselves uh, under the umbrella of the Greater India Society and the Greater India Movement. And they were principally studying uh, Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia, and to some extent, Indonesia. And what fascinated them were the remnants of uh, uh, Indian uh, culture, Indian ideas uh, from the first millennium, uh, the remnants which they encountered in the writing of Dutch and French uh, uh, archeologists uh, from the early 20th century. And the question they asked was that why should a region which is so proximate to China, and they were talking about Indochina, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, uh, and so on, uh, why should a region which is so proximate uh, uh, 
uh, to China have been so open uh, to Indian ideas, Indian culture, Indian artifacts, uh, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, following from an older tradition of European scholarship, uh, these Indian historians had termed, uh, had termed uh, this expansion of Indian ideas or this, this reception of Indian ideas uh, as being Indian colonies uh, in the Far East. Uh, and because they were termed as colonies with decolonization, this kind of scholarship uh, uh, was uh, vitiated by uh, uh, what the term which uh, Prasenjit Dwara has also uh, used, which is the, 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 the imperialism of the anti-imperialists or something like it. So, so this kind of scholarship didn't survive beyond the 50s, but this tangential view of China uh, in its proximate regions viewed by historians from India is something which has always struck me as being of great uh, interest. And really the papers in this volume uh, evoked that interest again. So may I in conclusion again, thank uh, Ambassador Ashok Kant and the Institute of Chinese Studies for inviting the ICWA and for inviting me to join this uh, platform. I'm very happy uh, to be able to congratulate uh, Professor Tansen Sen and Professor Brian Su for this wonderful volume and I greatly look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, indeed, uh, Ambassador Raghavan. I think uh, your very uh, thought-provoking uh, keynote has actually confirmed my assessment of the volume as likely to uh, uh, to lead to a thousand uh, hundred flowers blooming out of this research comes so many different uh, notions, different uh, avenues for further research. And clearly, um, we're just about beginning to start addressing uh, the, the, the myriad uh, issues. And uh, what you have uh, spoken about is uh, actually confirming that view that uh, much more is needed and uh, this volume is clearly um, initiating that process that uh, that that will that will, uh, will will hopefully bring many more scholars into this fold uh, i will now hand over the floor to the editors of the volume um, professor tan sen sen who is a professor of history and uh, director of the center for global asia at uh, nyu shanghai in china and uh, Global Network Professor at the NYU in uh, Shanghai. Uh, he's currently working on a book about uh, Chang He's maritime expeditions in early 15th century uh, and uh, co-editing um, with Aung San Ho, uh, The Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean. Um, that sounds uh, really formidable. And um, uh, Brian Sui, who teaches at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University of China, um, he is interested in the, now let me quote, intersection between revolutionary politics and mobilization of cultures on both the left and the right in China's 20th century. Uh, his current research focuses on the advent of new China as an Asia-wide event, um, zeroing in on how the early People's Republic of China was interpreted by Indian nationalists and Asian Christians in the 1950s. Uh, really, really uh, remarkable. That sounds uh, fascinating. And it uh, also, in one sense, underscores uh, the complete uh, uh, suitability of these two editors uh, to bring out a volume uh, such as this one. Uh, so over to you, Tansen. Uh, I think Brian is going to go first. He has a yep. PowerPoint that we'll share. So Brian, you want to share the PowerPoint? So I, I would uh, just dive in. Um, so thank you, um, Professor Acharya for uh, the, uh, organizing this event. It's really nice to see a lot of uh, colleagues. Um, online and uh, for her very, very generous introduction. I also want to thank uh, Ambassador Van Gogh for his uh, uh, very insightful um, um, provoking uh, 
a keynote address. Um, I, what I'm going to do in my short presentation is to uh, introduce to, uh, to, to let, uh, let us know how this uh, volume came about. Um, and then go through some of the themes that uh, Professor Cherry and, and Nefesta already have already uh, touched on. Um, so this project, uh, this uh, volume came out of a, a grant, a research grant uh, that uh, Tansen and I uh, secured uh, from the uh, Jiangxing Guo Changqing Kuo Foundation for International Scholarly Exchange. Um, which of course is based in Taipei. The goals back then was to uh, produce this uh, volume and also to uh, bring about uh, an electronic catalog in uh, both English and Chinese on major uh, archival, archival depositories uh, that pertain to uh, China, India uh, studies in the modern uh, period. Uh, uh, the, uh, our project started with a core group, uh, so that was uh, was a Tan, Tan Zen, uh, and then um, Matafi, uh, uh, Shield, uh, Anan Yang, uh, Liao Wenshuo, and uh, Zhang Ke, I think all of them uh, with us to a uh, night. Um, and uh, uh, we first uh, met in uh, uh, Canberra uh, at the Australian National University where I was then based as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, we uh, met for a few more times in Hong Kong, in, in Shanghai, and also in Taipei. So I uh, thank uh, these the, the institutions which have hosted us and, and uh, sort of uh, allow for this project to grow. Um, so the idea of these meetings was to sort of um, uh, map out the themes uh, that the volume will cover and also to identify uh, sort of uh, contributors to uh, this uh, volume. So we ended up with uh, 14 uh, uh, chapters, uh, core chapters written by uh, 40 different uh, um, scholars in uh, both uh, literary and historical studies. Um, and uh, the themes that uh, we, the uh, with introduction of course, but also the that sort of tied together the chapters. Um, uh, I think there are five. Uh, I think uh, later on, uh, Tencent might uh, fill us in if I have missed anything. Um, so we are very concerned with uh, the use of uh, sources, uh, archives and libraries. So one of the uh, ways in which these, uh, the grant uh, was used was to help uh, us in the, in, in the, in the core uh, uh, team to look for uh, this uh, archive materials in uh, respective in the in, in, in the archives that they are most uh, familiar with. Uh, so, for example, in the, the case of um, Tan Sen, he uh, spent a lot of time with the uh, West Bengal State Archives. Um, we have uh, Zhang Ke who uh, had uh, an assistant to go through. Uh, the archival materials in Shanghai and Chongqing uh, and so on. Um, so um, materials, and we also um, have uh, sort of uh, literary uh, scholars who work with uh, non-archival and literary sources uh, so that we can see that in uh, some of the chapters in uh, the volume. Um, and then of course, the, in terms of uh, themes, uh, we, uh, have uh, Pan-Asianism in our, our title, and um, uh, the previous two speakers have already alluded to this, uh, the ambiguities and the complicated uh, legacies of uh, this uh, ideal idea, uh, organizing uh, method, uh, and that uh, have been this uh, is sort of, uh, uh, this idea of Pan-Asianism has been discussed in a few of our uh, chapters. Um, we are interested not only in sort of nation state to nation states relations, uh, but also in sort of uh, trends uh, and connections that uh, go beyond uh, not only the present state uh, states of the People's Republic of China and Republic of India, but also um, through uh, this, uh, the South Asia, East Asia and beyond. Uh, 
Awards. And we, of course, um, uh, are interested in uh, connections and uh, ev uh, events, trends beyond uh, national uh, politics, state politics, and uh, state borders. Um, and finally, we uh, wanted to sort of think, uh, rethink, reconceptualize how we um, sort of uh, understand our, uh, the topic of uh, the, the whole idea of China-India uh, study. Uh, what does it bring uh, to us on the table in our sort of uh, pandemic sort of uh, uh, era as sort of uh, the social models brought about, uh, represented by sort of Washington and London seems uh, to be uh, in trouble. Um, whether sort of using um, China and Asia as China, sorry, China and India as method, uh, which of course is a uh, gesture towards using the historical experiences of these two societies to interrogate uh, cultural categories and also uh, the uh, dominance of, uh, of nation state led developmentalism. Um, so that uh, is themes uh, tie uh, this uh, volume uh, together. And I hope the introduction uh, does a decent job uh, walking uh, the readers through uh, these uh, themes. Um, so I will now uh, hand over to uh, Tan Zhen and I will uh, uh, be interested in your comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, if you can go to the next slide, Brian. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Kant and High Commissioner uh, Raghavan. Um, both of them I knew as diplomats, uh, uh, Ambassador Kant when he was in Beijing and then uh, High Commissioner Raghavan when he was in Singapore. Uh, in fact, it's good that you brought up uh, the Greater India Society. Uh, and if you remember, in Singapore, we actually worked on compiling some of the writings of these uh, Indian historians that you are mentioning uh, into a book. Uh, and I think that's a very, very important, valuable book uh, that we uh, published from Singapore with your help. Uh, and uh, as you remember, uh, PC Bakshi uh, was one of the figures involved in the Greater India Society. Kalidas Nag was another, both of them actually trained in Sinology, some of the leading figures uh, in India in India doing China studies. But thank you uh, to ICS, ICWA uh, for co-hosting this event. Um, whatever Brian was saying, as far as themes are concerned, are in the introduction. Um, what I'll be doing here, uh, talking about the different sections. Many of you don't have this book. Um, so I'll just point out uh, some of the sections and invite uh, one person from that section to explain that section to us, what uh, it accomplishes. Um, and, and they will speak on behalf of the other contributors uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this book. Uh, I'll then end up with uh, what we are going uh, next, where we are going with this collaborative research that we have done, and I would say successfully finished. Um, but one thing I wanted to add uh, with regard to the introduction is if you see the subtitle, it's from 1840s to 1960s. Uh, we use that in order to question how India-China contacts, India-China relations are periodized. Uh, we didn't want to give a fixed date. Uh, neither do, do we want to use 1962 as a huge uh, uh, watershed uh, as well. So uh, the, the reason we use 1840s and, 18, and 1960s is something that is explained in the introduction as well. Uh, the introduction, as Brian was pointing out, has some critical issues that we hope uh, others doing China and India could engage uh, with us with regard to that. Uh, and I would uh, highly encourage, if you don't have time to go through all the chapters, uh, at least read the introduction and perhaps engage with us at some points in, in, in the future. It would be good to get feedback, not only from those who are present here, but others who are going to read this book. Um, so I would just go through these uh, sections. If you see on the slide, uh, the first section uh, is a kind of intervention. This is, uh, these are three contributions that go beyond the archival research. These are looking at more of, of literature. Uh, and uh, Adira Mangalagri, who is 
uh, volunteering to talk about this section on behalf of uh, the two other contributors. So I would ask her to briefly talk about uh, the section and how it perhaps fits uh, into the book uh, and what kind of intervention you are making. Adira? Thanks, Nansen. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Uh, hi, I'm Adira Mangalagiri. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Comparative Literature at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm also an associate at the Harvard University Asia Center. Um, I know, first of all, that all of the contributors join me in thanking you and Brian Banson for bringing us all together and for all of your incredibly hard work to um, finally bringing this project to completion. Uh, so as Thompson mentioned, I'll talk about the first section entitled Epistemological Interventions. I remember when we met in Hong Kong, we had a very lengthy conversation about how exactly to go about organizing our volume. And we all agreed at the time that rather than a chronological progression of the chapters through the first decades of the 20th century, and also rather than a strictly disciplinary division of our chapters, it would actually make much more sense for us to showcase the interdisciplinariness of our group and also to highlight the kinds of interventions that this volume makes in existing scholarship. Um, so our section uh, contains chapters from three of us who actually, although we're all working with texts in a way, um, approach the idea of China, India thought from very distinct disciplinary vantage points. Um, the first chapter is by me and my work is rooted in comparative literature. I work specifically on 20th century Chinese and Hindi Urdu texts in comparative frameworks. And I also work on writers who actively engage with ideas of China and India in their literary practice. Um, the second chapter is by Gal Gwili, who is an assistant professor in the East Asian department at McGill University. Gal works primarily on modern Chinese literature during the late Qing and Republican periods um, with a particular focus on religious thought and literary realism. And the third chapter is by Viren Murthy, uh, an associate professor in the department of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who works on the history of philosophy and the revival of pre-modern philosophies in the writings of 20th century East Asian intellectuals. Uh, together, our three chapters in this section address how the China-India pairing actually disrupts dominant narratives of the development of intellectual thought in early 20th century China. When we look at existing scholarship on Republican China, we often find that engagements with the West or with Japan um, tend to be the main ways in which we understand the development of modern intellectual um, literary thought during this period. Um, in contrast to such narratives, we wanted to ask, how did thinking about China and India together um, enable writers to critique colonial and imperial paradigms? And how did imaginations of India play a central not simply peripheral, um, and also a transformative role in shaping Chinese intellectual and literary thought during the Republican period. So these are some of the questions that our um, section addresses. I'll go through now quickly each of the chapters. Uh, chapter one, as you can see, is entitled Slave of the Colonizer, the Indian Policeman in Chinese Literature. Um, in this chapter, I address the literary figure of the in in Indian policeman who, as many of you know, was stationed um, in Chinese treaty ports during the colonial period as an administrator and enforcer of colonial law on Chinese citizens. So my chapter reads a large collection of Chinese short stories, novels, and poetry that explicitly portray this figure of the Indian policeman. And I show how through a literary engagement with this Indian figure, writers were actually able to participate in and to reshape ongoing debates that were going on in um, May 4th and Republican era um, literary spheres in China, um, especially in regards to the concept of language, national autonomy, and visions of revolution. Uh, the second chapter by Gal is entitled China India Myths in Xu Shan's Goddess of Supreme Essence. Uh, the chapter closely reads a 1923 short story by Xu Shan. 
um, which showcases the writer's very long-standing scholarly interests in Sanskrit, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, and comparative religion. Gal argues in the chapter that Shudishan's engagement with Indian mythology and religions deeply informed his fiction by constituting a critique of social Darwinist ideas that were immensely popular during the May 4th um, and Republican periods. And chapter three by Virain is entitled Rethinking Pan-Asianism through Jiang Taiyan, India as Method, focusing on the writings of the Chinese revolutionary Jiang Taiyan. Virain shows how Jiang engage, engages with an idea of India in order to critique imperialist epistemologies, including Hegelian visions of progressive history. Uh, in this way, Jiang Taiyan's writings bring into view a hypothetical China-India alliance that is capable of transcending this dominant idea we have of Pan-Asianism as a Japanese-led project. So together, the three chapters challenge the more familiar Republican era understandings of history, colonialism, and the role of literature in national transformation. Um, the section contributes to the volume of a very superficial, yet very dominant still, notion of China-India connections as a form of friendship. Um, instead, we try to show how ideas of India actually played, played a transformative and a very productively disruptive role in the development of modern Chinese intellectual thought. Uh, and then very briefly, I'll just say how uh, our chapters contribute to this emerging field of China-India studies. Um, the speakers uh, have already uh, highlighted how much potential there is for further research. Um, and our chapters you know, really show how there's a wealth of texts that are yet to be examined. Uh, my chapter, for example, unearths um, an archive of overlooked and forgotten um, fiction and poetry from Shanghai's journals and magazines. And there are likely many more that I'm yet to discover um, and, but even beyond overlooked texts, even in the case of those historical figures who we think we know well, celebrated writers and intellectuals like Xu Di Shan or Zhang Taiyang, there's still uh, parts of their oeuvre that we are yet to explore, and there are still new ways to read their uh, much discussed writings. Um, also, our section focuses on the Republican era in the Chinese context. Um, but we hope that our work will point scholars um, and researchers toward exploring similar engagements with ideas of China in Indian literary and intellectual circles. Uh, in fact, many of us are already engaged in this kind of work. Um, and I would invite any of you who um, are interested uh, in this kind of work to join us. Okay, I'll end there, but I'm very happy to take questions about our section. Um, in the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Adira. Uh, so as uh, Adira was pointing out, our purpose is not only to say something that is the final word on, on these things, is to encourage uh, people attending uh, this event uh, to engage with us, just like in the introduction, you can engage with us with regard to the theoretical aspect of doing China and India. Uh, you will see in, in many of these sections, uh, the authors are bringing in uh, new ways of looking at existing sources, but also uh, pointing out to new sources that need to be examined. So uh, I hope students who are from JNU or DU would be encouraged to look through the footnotes uh, and, and find things that are of interest uh, and, and then work on those topics. You'll see a wealth of topics emerging, uh, particularly from these three chapters uh, and, and the sources that the three authors uh, are using. Uh, so the next section, Brian, if you could move uh, the, the slide uh, next, uh, the next slide. Uh, the section two uh, is uh, encounters and images. This is um, also has three uh, chapters here. This, uh, I think many of you in India are familiar with uh, Kamal Sheel, uh, who is I think in the audience here. Um, but Chanka is going to talk about the three chapters that also talk about uh, interesting sources uh, from archives uh, and uh, from libraries. So Chanka, do you want to talk about uh, your section? Yes. And introduce yourself, thank, thank, Chanka. Sure, uh, thank you, Tansen. Can I be heard? Is it okay? 
Yes, yes, you can. Do okay, that. okay. Uh, thank you, Tansen. Uh, hi, all. So it's my uh, pleasure to participate in this book project. As um, I'm now an associate professor at uh, Fudan University, Shanghai, China, and I'm uh, very uh, happy to join this uh, meeting. And I will see that uh, actually my first book was working on uh, modern Chinese intellectual history and uh, conceptual history. So like uh, back to five years ago, uh, I'm a new, I was a newcomer um, of Indian China studies. And I will say I learned a lot uh, from all these meetings and the conferences in our project. So uh, I, and also from the, all the personal talks with all the colleagues and friends in this group. So uh, I have to extend my thanks to all, to uh, Tansen, to Brian, and also to the organizers uh, of this event uh, to ICS. So according to the uh, format, I think I will briefly introduce uh, our section, that is section two. Uh, as Tansen have already mentioned, uh, that the title of this section is Encounters and Images. So uh, uh, the word encounters actually uh, implies that the section or the papers are mainly focused on the earlier period. And I would say it's from the mid uh, 19th century to early 20th century. So the section uh, consists of three chapters. Uh, the first chapter, uh, uh, my chapter actually is, uh, uh, the title is Through the Indian Lens, uh, Observations and Self-Reflections in Late Qing Chinese Travel Writings on India. And the second, um, I mean, uh, chapter five is written by uh, Professor Kama Shiu, uh, probably uh, also here. And I think many of you are quite familiar with uh, Professor Shiu. Uh, he is a distinguished professor uh, from uh, Bangladesh <coughs> Hindu University. And his chapter is working on Indian China connectedness, connectedness explorations in Hindu, sorry, Hindi sources materials on modern China. And the chapter six is uh, written by uh, Professor Anna Yang. Uh, professor Yang uh, teaches, is also a renowned uh, professor uh, of uh, history and international studies and, and at uh, University of Washington, Seattle. And his chapter is uh, titled China in the Popular Imagination, Images of Qing in North India at the term of 20th century. So I will see that uh, the three uh, chapters is both working on the mutual understandings and the mutual images of China, India respectively uh, from each other uh, uh, in this time period. So um, I will briefly introduce the three chapters um, now. So first of all, my uh, chapter, uh, it has something to do with uh, uh, my, another work, which I'm currently working on is the editing and the uh, compilation of all these uh, Chinese travelogues to India at that time. And especially uh, now I'm working on the late Qing period that is from mid 19th century to uh, 1911. So all these travelogues and I, uh, in my chapter, I uh, investigated 10 travelogues and uh, uh, all these authors, including many uh, renowned and influential scholars and politicians like Kang Yao Wei and Ma Jianzhong and other authors. And I will argue that all this late Qing, uh, let me see. Yeah, all these late Qing Chinese writings on India actually review new types of connections connections, concerns, and the perceptions compared to the content of past, uh, Chinese writings. Uh, as, as you know, like especially this write, writings by uh, Buddhist monks. And uh, this chapter actually examines uh, some of the late Qing writing in order to demonstrate two modes of observation. I mean, two modes of observation and critical reflection. So on the one hand, by observing and analyzing India, the Chinese authors try to gain knowledge of British rule and the Western culture it represented. But on the other hand, seeing a reflection of China in India, they pondered, China, pondered China's own international crisis through these writings. So often these two modes were intertwined with China and Britain alternatively become 
the other in the Chinese imagination. And uh, uh, chapter, I would say chapter five written by uh, Professor Kamashu and also investigates all these Hindi uh, sources uh, from 19th century to first, first World War. And uh, Professor Xiu uh, um, mentioned that there are four types of subjects, four types of this kind of materials. I think the first type related to the introduction of China at that time through travelogues, pieces of information on Chinese life and society, stories and illustrations. And the second is all these essays, editorials, reviews, and the detailed comments on contemporary events in China. And the third actually is all these Indian intellectuals and discussions of convergence and the differences between India and China in the context of certain idea of Asia or Asianism at that time. And I think the fourth uh, uh, type actually is, uh, consists most of these news items taken from in, uh, English papers on domestic politics, as well as internal, international politics movements and so on. So Professor Xiu actually investigates uh, uh, important authors like uh, Gadaha Singh, like Banasaka, like uh, Tagore, of course. And I think uh, they all basically, I would say that they praise the achievements of Chinese civilization and uh, uh, express the um, uh, feeling of sympathy of uh, China's uh, contemporary crisis. And also they paid a lot of, uh, of attention to the uh, 1911 revolution of, in China. And also he investigates all these reactions to that revolution. And I think uh, Professor uh, Xiu's uh, paper and the Professor Yang, Anna Yang's paper is uh, closely connected as Professor Anna Yang also investigates uh, um, uh, how did uh, people in colonial India uh, uh, consider China and especially uh, uh, it's about uh, the, the boxer uprising and uh, uh, the um, uh, foreign legation and the war in 1900. And I think uh, Professor Young's uh, article uh, used a lot of uh, materials, not only that I have to mention that uh, uh, Professor Xu and Professor Young uh, complete a very um, I would say a fantastic translation and edition of Gadaha Singh's a, a famous book and three years and publishes three years ago. So not only this book, but also uh, other um, sources uh, in, in Hindi, uh, Urdu and other languages. So he uh, investigates how they uh, preserve the crash between China and the foreign power, powers and the British in India at that time. So uh, to summarize this, I will see that both of our um, papers just um, mm, 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 want to review the birth of the, and the development of the feeling of uh, empathy and sympathy at that time from the mid 19th, mid 19th century to early 20th century and also reviews the uh, mutual understandings and images of China, India uh, from both sides. So yeah, I think that Thank I you. will introduce. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tanka. Thank you. And this section also brings out a uh, new material that still needs to be explored. Even the, the book that Chanka just mentioned uh, translated by Anand uh, and Kamal Tina Terra Mas, uh, 13 months in China. This is published in the series where this book is coming out is actually a resource that people can, can use to do further studies about the boxes seen by India Indians. Uh, there's actually another work on the boxes written in Bengali that has not been translated into English that could also be seen uh, how the Indian soldiers are going and fighting on behalf of the British uh, in China. Very, very important sources uh, and, and other sources that Chanka has written about, including Kang Yo Wei, not a good easy text to read, but very important text to understand how the Chinese are perceiving India in the turn of the century. 
Uh, the next section has four chapters. Uh, uh, it's called Cultures and Mediators. Uh, it's looking at people uh, and institutions that connected China and India. Uh, and to tell us about the section uh, is Sawin. Sawin, in, introduce yourself and, and then the chapters. Right, thanks. Thanks, Tenson. And uh, uh, thank you for the organizers first. Thank you, uh, Professor Acharya, and uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Ragben. And I also need to thank our editor, our two editor, Professor Tenson and uh, uh, Professor Brian for bringing us together and for this very wonderful and incredible uh, editor volume. And uh, I'm, I'm Cao Ying, I'm teaching uh, Indian history and the global history in Tsinghua University in Beijing. And uh, three years ago, I finished a book it's about the Sikh diaspora in, in, in Shanghai during the colonial period. And uh, at that time, I actually I have a, a chapter which is not included in my book. That is a Hong Kong's uh, Sikh community, which I'm lucky enough to be uh, invited to participate in this project and bring my 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 unfinished article here in this editor warning. And now I'm working on another project, which is about the uh, Chinese sojourners, Chinese smugglers, deserters, soldiers in in India during the Second World War. So it's it's different one, but it's also about India and China. And uh, I, I'm honored to, to be here to present our section, section three, cultures and, uh, and mediators. Uh, and in this section, actually, uh, we have four we have four chapters, and in all four chapters, I think it's just a reflection of what pre Professor President Dwyer said that how to rescue uh, history of this uh, culture and mediators from the nation. That or if you read all of the four chapters, you'll find that it's kind of the the, the culture and uh, the mediators between India and China. Uh, some of them cannot be accommodated into the national history, whether it's Indian national history or Chinese national history. And we have to explore some alternative methodologies and the primary sources to uh, write down their, their history, the alternative history. And uh, I will just briefly introduce the four uh, chapters in this section. And uh, the, first, uh, the first chapter is written by Professor Ni Yu Ting who is an assistant professor in the Graduate Institute of National Development in National University, uh, uh, National Taiwan University. And uh, this chapter entitled Taigo and China Reconsidered, uh, starting uh, from a conversation from, with uh, Feng Yu Nan. We, by exploring a conversation between Taigo and Feng Yu, Feng Yu Nan that happened in 1920 in New York City, so this chapter tries to shed light on how Taigo and his Chinese intellectual counterparts in the 1920s developed an orientalist perception on China and, and India respectively. So this chapter actually examines in the inter, uh, interconnections between uh, the thought of uh, Taigo, Feng Yunnan, Liang Suming, and the other Chinese opinion leaders of early 20th century. And by contrasting these interconnections with Taiko's uh, interactions with contemporary Western thinkers, it is hoped that a new perspective will emerge to reveal the depths of the intellectual exchange that, that took place between modern China and uh, India. So move to the second chapter in this section written by uh, Brian Xu, our, our main editor in this volume. And uh, Brian is an uh, assistant uh, associate professor in the Department of Chinese Culture in Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And uh, his chapter entitled When Culture Meets State Diplomacy, the case of China Bhavana. Right? So Brian takes the China Bhavana, uh, the center of Sino Indian cultural studies in Western Bengal, founded by Tai Yunshan in 19. Uh, 37 to explore the uh, promise and uh, pitfalls of China India uh, interactions in the 1930s and the 1940s, especially during the Second World War. Right? So, this chapter uh, tries to unveil the complicated uh, uh, relations between Tai Yunshan, the Chinese nationalist government, 
the British colonial authorities and uh, the Indian nationalist intellectuals as well. So Brian provides us an ambiguous portrait of Tai Yunshan, who on the one hand was an idealist and a radical critic of uh, capitalist modernity, but on the other hand, a pragmatist, a pragmatist uh, who used all possible opportunities to uh, secure financial support from the Chinese national nationalist government, and uh, even by siding uh, himself with uh, uh, nationalist political agendas, right? So in the end, in the end, Brian argues that the China Bavana was a was an important experiment for being an uh, institutional artic uh, articulation of a uh, um, how to say the civilizational idea, a vision of national uh, Asianness, the unity um, that was supposed to overcome the violence and the mutual suspicion between uh, modern nation states. However, it was also true that China Bavana was employed in wartime nationalist uh, politics and uh, great power diplomacy, despite its transcendental vision. So our third chapter in this section written by myself, uh, erecting a Gadvara on Queen's Road East, the Sikh Saba movement, the Boxer Uprising, and the Sikh community in Hong Kong. So this chapter examines origins of the Sikh temple in Hong Kong and its transnational and the translocal uh, implications. So I find that the Sikh Saba movement, which was a Sikh religious uh, movement that happened in the late 19th century in, in Punjab sti stimulated the building of Gadavarars across the region in Northwestern India, right? So as tens of thousands of the Sikh uh, population migrated to, to, from Punjab to Southeast and East Asia uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, so most of them, most of the Sikh migrants were soldiers and, uh, and, uh, and a policemen. Right. So the Sikh Sabha movement participants and those Sikh priests, they went along with these Sikh migrants and uh, supported the building of Gadavaras, not only in Punjab, but also in Singapore, Penang, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and beyond. So the building of the Hong Kong Gadavara was one of them, right, was financially supported by Sikh soldiers who were dispatched by by the government of India to China to fight against the Chinese boxers in 1900. And uh, the final chapter written by Janice Zheng, who just uh, accomplished her, her PhD degree in, uh, in the Department of History at Duke University in the US. And uh, this chapter entitled the Mecca between China and India, wartime Chinese Islamic uh, <coughs> diplomat diplomatic mission across the Indian Ocean. So in this chapter, Janice tells us the story of the Chinese Islamic goodwill mission, which was dispatched by the Chinese nationalist government to, to the Near East, to the Middle East, uh, during the Second Sino-Japanese War for obtaining the, the support and sympathy of the Islamic world. So in this chapter, Janice examines the missions, activities, not in the Middle East, but in India on its way to Mecca. So uh, its interactions with local, I mean, Indian Muslim leaders and the Chinese Muslims who settled down, who migrated from China, especially from Xinjiang, settled down in, in India. So she argues that the Chinese Islamic delegations to India between 1937 and 1945 paved the way for the establishment of official diplomatic relations between nationalist China and Pakistan upon the latest funding. So that's a summarize of these chapters in, in, my, in my section. So back to you, Tenzin. Thank you so much, uh, Cao Yan. Uh, and again, uh, following the trend, there are lots of new things uh, in these chapters. And then one argument that India-China contacts extend beyond India-China as can be seen from Janice's chapter where she brings in the Near East or, or the Middle, Middle East. Um, so if you can move it to the next uh, slide, Brian, uh, this is the final section uh, of the book uh, and it has uh, four chapters as well. And to introduce uh, 
uh, this section, uh, I'll invite Anne, and if you could in, uh, introduce yourself and then talk about the chapters. Sure. Um, hi, um, I, my name is Anne Reinhardt. I'm a professor of history at Williams College in Massachusetts in the US. Um, and um, I am a historian of China uh, primarily, but got very interested in this project and was very pleased to be um, included in the volume um, because I have been doing work on um, trying to use uh, shipping as a way of understanding semi-colonialism in China and trying to sort of describe what that is. And I found over the course of that um, long research for um, my first book that it was very difficult to articulate the specificity of what is going on in China in the 19th and 20th century without having some recourse to the experience of India as well. So again, I found a comparative framework very helpful in that early work and was um, again, pleased to be able to bring it into this group as well. Um, and section four of our volume is entitled uh, Building and Challenging Imperial Networks. And the methods in this section are um, fairly straightforwardly historical. Um, the section consists of four essays that address different relationships, interactions, and comparisons between India and China in the early to mid 20th century and extending uh, as late as the 1960s. So again, as many of the other sections of the volume, many of these pieces also introduce readers to either newly opened or um, very much underexplored archival collections that offer new perspectives and um, new perspectives on connections between India and China in this period of kind of early to mid 20th century. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of the essays very briefly and then talk about some common themes that I see among them. Um, but first, um, we have uh, Madhavi uh, Thampi's essay, um, Indian Political Activism in Republican China. And I, many of you um, probably already know, uh, Professor Thampi is currently an honorary fellow of the Institute of um, Chinese Studies in New Delhi, and formerly a member of the Department of East Asian Studies at Delhi University. But her essay examines China particularly Hong Kong and the Eastern Treaty Ports as important, as important sites of recruitment and political mobilization by Indian anti-imperialist organizations and by exiled Indian nationalists. So drawing on materials from the National Archives of India and colonial office records in Hong Kong, she details the political activities of both these activists as well as um, migrant working communities of soldiers, police, watchmen, among others who contributed to sustained political activism from the early part of the 20th century through the 1930s. Uh, the second essay is uh, by Wen Shuo Liao, who is the associate researcher at Academia Historica in Taipei. And her essay, Between Alliance and Rivalry, Nationalist China and India during the Second World War, utilizes newly available military, diplomatic, and intelligence sources in the Kuomintang Party archives and in, in the Jiang Kai-shek collection, among others at Academia Historica in Taiwan, to explicate a range of examples of how nationalist China's changing understanding of India and Indian politics informed diplomacy and national policies during the early stages of the Pacific War. So in particular, she examines di diplomatic overtures by Jiang Kai-shek and other Kuomintang leaders um, to Indian leaders, as well as the achievement of the Kuomintang's wartime intelligence networks there. Uh, my essay, which is called Shipping Nationalism in China and India, compares um, the leaders of two important Indian and Chinese shipping companies in the early 20th centuries and their respective engagements um, with shipping nationalism, which is a term I use to encompass political and entrepreneurial efforts to challenge British and Japanese domination of shipping trades and markets, as well as attempts to establish um, national merchant fleets in both cases. And in my essay, despite unmistakable parallels in these two men's understandings of the problems they faced and the solutions they proposed for them, my study remains a comparison rather than a case of actual interaction or connection. So as far as I can tell, they did not know of one another's activities 
or really actively engage with shipping nationalism in contexts other than their own. And I'll describe what I think the significance of that is in just a moment. And Tansen Sen, who needs no further introduction, his essay is entitled The Chinese Intrigue in Kalimpong, Intelligence Gathering and the Spies in a Contact Zone, in which he makes use of the records of the intelligence branch of West Bengal in the State Archives of Calcutta to examine the hill town of Kalimpong in Northwest India as a site of covert espionage activities involving Chinese Indian and Tibetan interests. And his essay traces how the intelligence branch amassed knowledge on Chinese agents in Kalimpong and how that knowledge was put to different uses as the geopolitical relationship between India and China transformed. So again, Tansen's essay emphasizes um, the continuities in the Indian government's intelligence concerns and activities in this area before and after independence, noting that the more dramatic shifts come only in the late 1950s with the deterioration, as he says, of Indian Sino-Indian relations. All four of these essays start from the premise that the existing structures of empire in Asia, as well as the efforts to dismantle them, were sites of significant opportunity for connection and at times the possibility of solidarity between Indian and Chinese actors in the first half of the 20th century. And in all four essays, the British Empire in India, as well as its presence in China, furnished many of the structures, be these the migrant communities ripe for political mobilization, the limitations on wartime diplomatic alliances, shipping networks and systems, and longstanding intelligence networks and priorities. And in most of these papers as well, these structures are further complicated um, and at times brought into crisis by Japan's imperial ambitions. So again, something that we've been discussing throughout um, this session, Japan appears throughout these four essays in different guises, as a model and a mentor in some cases, as obviously an antagonist and threat in others, and in one case as a kind of outside observer. But in focusing on these structures in different spaces and contexts, these es the essays in this section highlight shared experiences and predicaments that China and India faced in the early 20th century. And the negotiation of connections based on such experience can reveal to us both new facets of what might seem to be very kind of old or maybe very overdetermined problems of anti-imperialist or nationalist movements, as well as a greater understanding of the persistence and the continued relevance of the structures of empire. But at the same time, the section of the book also can draw our attention to the limitations and constraints on modes of connection and interaction between China and India in this particular historical context. So just to point out, when Shuo's essay, for example, shows how the Guomindang had to subordinate its hopes for a closer relationship with the Indian National Congress, its counterpart, to its wartime alliances with Britain and the United States. And while Madhavi is able to show a very important transnational dimension of Indian nationalist political mobilization in China, my study of the parallel preoccupations of Indian and Chinese shipping entrepreneurs in the same period suggests that their commitments to, were to a narrower and much more exclusive concept of nation. And this is the irony and the, the sort of challenge that uh, um, Ambassador Raghavan was pointing out earlier. Um, and now again, I, I just want to point out that this was not simply a failure of imagination, but a response to concrete conditions of imperialist domination in shipping that constructed shipping essentially as a national or exclusively national industry. And Tansen's essay shows how cross-border movement and trade at Kalimpong, in Kalimpong engendered similar suspicions and security questions for both the colonial and the post-colonial states. So I, I'm trying to point out how the obstacles to connection in these contexts are often the product of these historical actors enmeshments in larger global systems of domination or subordination. And under these conditions, sometimes these very powerful possibilities that might come from connections between India and China remain elusive or limited. So of course, as many others have pointed out that um, particularly the revelation of um, these really fascinating archival sources that 
uh, many of the scholars in this section have done point us to many new topics and dimensions of this process yet to be discovered. So again, I'll join my colleagues in, in suggesting that these are questions that are raised by this section, but the section is far from exhausting the possibilities for um, research and interrogation there. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, we are running out of time, but I think this was a good introduction to the book, uh, a good advertisement for the book. Uh, and uh, it will be available on Amazon, uh, both in the US and uh, in India soon. Uh, E-version will be available from the 15th of December, so you can order uh, the book or the E-version from there. I'll just end with uh, one slide about where we are going with this and then maybe open up for Q&A from the remaining time. So if, Brian, if you can move to the next uh, slide. Uh, so uh, after doing most of the studies uh, with the archives, our aim was to do pre-1947, but we ended up doing post-47 as well. And we realized that there's a lot of material in the 1950s that's coming up, especially with the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library opening up the Nehru papers. Uh, so with Arunav Ghosh, who has written a wonderful article with regard to why we must look at 1950s from a different perspective rather than just ge geopolitical. Uh, we are looking at the Nehru papers uh, and, and trying to find out the ways in which uh, connections and compar comparisons that we have highlighted in, in this volume can also be used to study the 1950s, uh, which remains for, for many of us still an unexamined un uh, decade. Uh, and, and so that's what we are doing right now. Uh, we are also working on methods in India-China studies or China-India studies that came up during our writing of this book and, and the research on this book. Uh, and we are working on a workshop and we are working on publications uh, on both these topics. They will be coming out uh, within the next year or so. Uh, those of you who are interested in, in joining us, you're welcome to write to us and, and we'll you know, involve you in that. We are also creating a database on the archival uh, research that we have done, the things that Madhvi has collected from the National Archives in India, that I have collected from the West Bengal State Archives, that uh, Chankha has collected from Shanghai and Chongqing. We want to put this on a database uh, at our Center for Global Asia in Shanghai uh, so that many other people interested in archives could use. Uh, and I should just uh, do an advertisement for my article that is coming out in Journal of Asian Studies um, next year, early next year, uh, on the state of China in their studies, which I hope will be of use to many of the people uh, still hanging out uh, and listening to what we have to say. So we'll end with uh, one final slide. Uh, this is, uh, if Brian, uh, you missed the slide. <laughs> Go back, Brian. Yes. Uh, we don't only work in archives, we also have fun. Uh, this is uh, my apartment in Shanghai. We, we uh, celebrate uh, our research by cooking Indian food and eating uh, Indian food. So if you join us, uh, you won't be spending all the time in archives. You'll also spend time hanging out with us uh, and eating with us. Thank you so much. Okay, now that Itansen is really an inducement to join, right? So uh, now we've got uh, just about under 10 minutes. And um, uh, what I will suggest is that I'll just go through the, because there's no hand raised, which means that there are just some questions which have been written. Uh, one general one, which I've also got messages you already answered, Tansen, about people wanting to get this book. So where do they get it from? Uh, so that you've answered. Now, um, a couple of uh, very specific questions, and then there are some some larger questions, you know, which is um, which is stemming from the, as I mentioned, the current kind of uh, hang that we are in, which is that uh, how much India is really relevant to China. Uh, aren't Indians overstressing their feelings that somehow India is important to China? I think, you know, this is, um, as I said, uh, in, the, in that category, which is dominated by the the current issue, but um, that's that's one uh, kind of question. But uh, the the more specific ones are about one, which is in fact uh, we have uh, Prabhavati who has uh, put in a lot of questions. Um, she wants to know how much of Amitabh Ghosh's fiction and how much is true because it's there also uh, his books also pertain to this period. 
and um, she also wants to know um, Chongqing was the main point of supplies in World War II, and is there any material available um, available for this? Now, Jabin has put in, typed in a huge uh, uh, question. Jabin, would you like to say it out or uh, read it out? Can I quickly answer uh, the former two questions? Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I, I think uh, if you ask Amitav Ghosh, you would say his books are fiction. Uh, he does not, he is writing uh, a non-fiction for India China, which will come out in two years. Uh, but the Ibis trilogy, he would say uh, is fiction. But if you look at what sources has, he has used, they are mostly archival sources. Um, but uh, it has a very important message, uh, the books, uh, which I think can be seen and, and understood and Madhvi can perhaps add to it because it involves the period that uh, she has worked on, the Parsis. Um, you, you can get a very important perspective that we historians perhaps cannot offer uh, and, and usually are very dry about. So I would encourage people to read Ibis Trilogy and then go to the archives uh, and join us. Uh, Chongqing's material is available. Uh, Changke has compiled a lot of material about that. We'll be putting the information on the database. Uh, and and, and ho I hope somebody will uh, actually look at that. I don't know if Madhvi or anybody wanted to add anything. Um, if not, Jabin has a today question, I see. So Jabin, would you like to um, speak out your question? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations, Tansen and Brian, for this uh, book. I haven't got a hold of it, but I do teach uh, the chapter on Pan-Asianism from uh, Tansen's uh, book on connected history to my students uh, as an introduction to China course. And I'm also pleased to see uh, Professor Anne Reinhardt here, whose uh, work on navigating semi-colonialism. I have the section of that uh, in a, actually another course on science, tech, and IR, international relations. Uh, but so Tansen, my question is long, but with a long preamble, but it's a very straightforward, simple question, as in, uh, in this current milieu uh, of Hindutva politics, uh, increased nationalism in China, uh, how do we, you know, how, how is uh, pan-Asianism uh, relevant anymore? Uh, you know, I quote specifically Ramnath Biswas, you know, who cycled all the way to China. His ardor was great, but there are no such opportunities anymore. And that ardor is constantly challenged, uh, you know, with what goes on around uh, or in India-China relations. So, you know, how do we you know, deal so, with this reality. So, uh, Jabin, if you look at the title of our book, it's called Beyond Pan-Asianism. So you have to go beyond Pan-Asianism to address these issues uh, because it did not work in the past. I don't think it's going to work in, in the future. Um, uh, it's a whole different things that you, needs to be done, starting with actually building good China studies program in India. Uh, and, and if uh, whatever Ramnath Bishas did, uh, cycling along uh, in, in, in China, uh, we should do that more. Uh, and, and let's invite the Chinese to come and also bicycle around in India. Uh, unless that happens, I think the, the main goal of Pan-Asianism may have been to encourage people to people contacts. Uh, and I still believe in that. Uh, unless that happens, we are not going anywhere. I, I don't well, know if other uh, I want to add on that, but... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I was just about to say that would any of your panelists uh, want to come in on any issue uh, uh, for a quick uh, minute or so? Can I, can I say something perhaps uh, with... Uh, on, yes, on, Brian, on, of course. The Japanese uh, uh, question of whether the relevance of Pan-Asianism. Um, well, there are two types of Pan-Asianism that have sort of uh, that have developed one uh, in the beginning, was more of a sort of bottom-up sort of uh, uh, phenomenon involving uh, radicals and intellectuals. There were many of them based in Tokyo and was open to these ideas. And then later on, of course, Pan-Asianism became a sort of state-driven uh, project, um, and that, of course, became you know the after the end of the the Pacific War, Second World War, a Pan-Asianism as a political project was no longer feasible. I mean, it moved into something else with the, uh, the, the third world uh, project. Um, but uh, Pan-Asianism as a sort of a way of think thinking about how India sort of scholars in Asia, not only China, India, but across Asia, 
can get together and think of uh, short developments and ways to uh, go beyond sort of Asian American, uh, sort of rural American uh, hegemony is, is still, I think, a, a very um, useful, a very sort of uh, a possible uh, uh, venture. Of course, it really depends on what Tan says we're saying that there, 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 is a, there needs to be a stream of people to people contact, like what we are doing right now. Uh, on even you know, virtually, and uh, and then and then so that's why we have I brought in the whole idea of the Asia and the Asian China Asia's method because I don't uh, we don't particularly have a, have a consensus of well have of the usefulness of uh, this particular idea, but the 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 uh, impulse on the part of Chen Guangxing in Taiwan to uh, where they bring together regularly um, interested scholars in Asia to talk about. Uh, issues in Asia from the own uh, from the Asian perspectives uh, is I think something that we can uh, or sort of you know sort of think 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 more about I mean we cannot we, we don't need to go through uh, London or Washington and New York all the time but we can uh, do it through like uh, Shanghai Delhi uh, Hong Kong Taipei whatever yeah so that's my response to remember response to Japanese uh, comments. I also quickly add something, please. Yes, please, one minute. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, building on Tansen's point about having Chinese studies programs that um, related to that is the importance for language study. And part of the, the project of Pan-Asianism in the early 20th century was, you know, more so than thinking of an, a concept of Asia together, part of the impetus was to disrupt dominant narratives, to, to think beyond um, imperialist colonial paradigms. Um, and, and so today, in order to really go beyond the kinds of narratives that we see in popular media that we're inundated with, we really have to start at the bottom with language study, which will enable us to go to new texts, to look at those texts that don't make it into the mainstream narratives. Um, and so I really would stress the importance of those very foundational building blocks. And one of those essential building blocks is really language study. And um, the, the challenge is all the more compounded for our Chinese colleagues because there are so many languages to contend with. Um, but on the India side, in China, we don't have access um, in English to the amount of materials that we do on, in um, the context of um, colonial archives in India, for example, or even um, post-colonial ones. And so, especially for us Indians, I think it's really important to start with our good solid foundations in language study. Well, you couldn't have underlined a more important uh, issue, and that's really, um, as the Hindi phrase goes, it's a dukti rug. It's a painful vein in, you know, our scholarship on China. But yes, we have to work on that. Uh, so there are uh, the usual compliments, and the rest of the chat box has some compliments for the great effort you've done. And uh, um, Arunab has uh, replied to uh, the question on Amitabh Ghosh's uh, sources. So by 2022, there may be a book uh, appearing over there. Um, there are so many things that one would really like to respond to, but uh, I'm afraid we've just now run out of time. Um, so I would now have to uh, unfortunately um, stop the questions at that point. But in conclusion, um, that whole point that came through, you know, I mean, when I started off by saying that the atmosphere is really one which is, which is permeated by a lot of, a lot of uh, angst and a lot of distrust and so on. And in that context, when we are discussing a book on beyond Pan-Asianism, India, China, connected histories, circulatory kind of issues. Um, then we, we still have a question about, um, well, how important is India to China? And so may I request our keynote speaker who straddles the, the divide, you know, between the academic kind of issues on one hand, but as a diplomat, how do you ultimately address this question of how important are China and India to each other. You did mention in your uh, in your keynote that, that China and India will be very, this is a very important relationship. Um, so maybe you could give us some concluding thoughts and then we'll wrap up the show. Uh, Ambassador Raghavan? 
Thank you. I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, there's no doubt. Uh, certainly, from an Indian perspective, China is very important, uh, and I would imagine, from a Chinese perspective, the same view uh, would be there. Uh, why is it so? Uh, your large countries, your very proximate uh, uh, to each uh, uh, other, uh, and you have a history of adversarial relations. So. If for no other reason, uh, these three factors uh, uh, make a kind of an imperative that uh, you do give importance uh, to this uh, relationship. It is uh, in today's world, you cannot uh, ignore uh, powerful neighbors uh, uh, with whom you have a history of adversarial relations in your long-term national interest. So I think uh, in that very practical day-to-day -day sense, uh, the importance of both countries uh, for each other uh, is self-evident. Uh, uh, but having said that, there are, of course, uh, other, uh, there are other factors also, not least the which, uh, of which is the fact that both countries have long traditions uh, of uh, giving uh, importance to uh, intellectual uh, activity. Uh, I don't think... Uh, one can understand uh, uh, either China uh, or India, quite regardless of their relationship with each other. We can understand either of these countries without uh, taking into account the very great importance both have given uh, for a very long period of time uh, to intellectual uh, discourse and intellectual uh, uh, activity. And when you have two neighbors which, are, uh, which have that kind of tradition, it is inevitable that uh, scholars and intellectuals on both sides uh, will find commonalities, which will in many ways uh, uh, transcend uh, the immediate uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the present day uh, force of uh, events. Uh, is it possible for scholarship to remain unaffected by uh, the prevailing uh, geopolitics of the times? I don't think it is. I don't think. It one can be uh, unrealistic in assuming that uh, in any situation, anywhere in the world, uh, that contemporary factors uh, do not uh, have an impact on uh, uh, intellectual uh, activity. So I think uh, these difficulties are there, but they are by no means unique to India and uh, China. These are situations under which uh, scholarship uh, exists all across the world and it's possibly always existed uh, in these circumstances. And a certain amount of a, uh, atmosphere which has a zing to it, I think uh, acts, as a, uh, uh, acts as a push for even a better uh, scholarship. Well, I think uh, thereby you have made a absolutely uh, undisputable, uh, undisputable and unchallengeable case for promoting the study of China in India and that uh, there needs to be some very, very serious thought given uh, to removing the kind of uh, obstacles and problems, uh, some of which were referred to by Jabin, uh, in the way of the scholarship. And sure, um, it may not be unaffected by the temporality of the situation, um, but uh, I think uh, beyond Pan-Asianism actually makes a case for in-depth studies which can actually go away from the whole hustle and bustle of what's happening on the border and uh, explore a, a past and explore a period which can actually then come into the present. I mean, that's what, that's what the study of the past is all about, that it helps you shape your future. And so for that, uh, for that, I thank you for your, uh, for your input and thanks to all the participants, uh, uh, to the panel, to the editors, um, to all the people who have come together to make this, uh, this webinar so, so brilliant. And uh, I hope- uh, To you, Alka, thank you for, for <laughs> caring and, and the, the Institute of Chinese Studies staff uh, for <laughs> managing this, so I think, we really appreciate how you have managed this. This is our first book launch. 
for this book. And so thank many you. Many more, many more to come if uh, what you said is any indication. So thank you all very much. I am sure uh, we will have plenty to think about, especially those who are looking at these things. Um, and um, have a good night or good day or whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, goodbye all. Stay safe and um, wear your masks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.